Imagine a world where you knew that you mattered and you belonged. The people cared about you because we were so darn good at listening to one another, no matter how different we are. That is what Sidewalk Talk is doing by putting listeners on sidewalks all over the world so that we can practice the art of connecting. Join me, founder and director Tracy Rubel, as I interview experts on the fine art of human connection and interview some of our volunteers who've been listening on the sidewalk and even some of the folks that we've listened to. And if you want to volunteer, consider joining us at sidewalk-talk.org. I have such a fondness for this next guest. Dick Schwartz is a sweetheart of a human who really listened to clients over the years and came up with a new model that doesn't look for how people are sick, but looks at how their parts are not working in collaboration together, and I think is one of the most simple, elegant, and I feel empowering ways to work in psychotherapy. This conversation gets juicy because we get to talk a little bit about parts work as we listen. And we also talk about parts of self that come up in activism and racism. So really went all over the place in terms of how this model of internal family systems can be applied to so many places in our lives. But my favorite part of the model is that we are all made up of parts of self and that becoming unitary is not the goal. And old school psychotherapy used to say that if you had parts, you were sick. He's like, we all have parts. And the more that I work with myself in that way, the gentler, kinder person I am in my life. So I hope you get as much out of this conversation and fall in love with this work as I have. Dr. Richard C. Schwartz, founder of Internal Family Systems. So Dick Schwartz, I'm super excited to have you here. I say that every time, but I am super excited to have you here. And um, your work has, you know what? I just heard you on one of the guys' podcasts from Queer Eye for the Straight Guy. I mean, if you're on one of those podcasts, that means IFS and internal family systems is touching a lot of lives. How, How are you, first of all, holding this gigantic ballooning of this theory how have you been personally sort of manifesting this and and holding it and growing it how's it been for you uh well first it's it's great to see you again and i really want to support what you're doing i love it and uh how is it it's uh it's kind of interesting because when i first stumbled into all this which is goes back to the mid 1980s when i really got a vision of the possibility of this. The vision was big. The vision of the impact was quite big. And I felt, and I still have parts to feel this way, like, who am I, you know? Uh, This was put in my face, and I sure hope the person who can take it where it's supposed to go comes along. Because at the time, I was just a little 32-year-old kid very irresponsible and so on. And now some of that vision is happening and it turns out I'm the one I've been waiting for, that I, you know, I'm the one who has to deliver it and I've had to do a lot of work on myself to, you know, to bring it this far. And uh, so it's, it's very, uh, huh, at the same time, gratifying and also uh, overwhelming because uh, I'm not an organized person and there's just, I'm bombarded with stuff. Well, I know that for me personally, hearing you say that, I said to you earlier, I feel a sense of relief at knowing that even somebody that I admire has some vulnerabilities around their leadership. And I love that you just said, hey, I have this part of mine that feels like an imposter sometimes mm-hmm. and I have to work with that part it sounds like yeah I've had to do a lot of work with that part yeah yeah, yeah. thank you for doing the work with that part oh uh, you're welcome so that yeah, we can benefit you know you're welcome you know what I there was a point 
maybe 25 years ago where it became clear that the parts that had driven me to create this and to bring it to the world weren't serving me as a leader. So I'll, over all that time, I've had to do a lot of work with different parts of me that were getting in the way. And uh, I think, you know, it took this long. You know, it, it'll be 40 years before too long um, because I had to get out of the way more and more. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to take this in a direction I wasn't expecting to, but just reflecting back on that, therapists are trained in a particular way in American culture, I'll start with American culture, that maybe doesn't support us in, in acknowledging the parts of ourself and has us maybe showing up in our lives and with our clients in a particular way that that maybe doesn't allow us to bring our gifts to the world. Are there, if you had a wish list of ways that you could maybe change the way therapists are, are trained, is there something that you've learned over these years that you're like, gosh, I wish, I wish the therapists were trained a little bit more in this way so that they were prepared and didn't have to go through maybe all the steps that I went through? Yeah, I mean, I think there are a lot of things. Uh, and I don't want to ge overgeneralize too much in terms of how therapists are trained. But many of the things that I had to unlearn and would like to spare other therapists that, that task is, uh, one is that uh, you don't have to be an expert, um, that your clients carry all the wisdom and, and uh, healing ability that both of you need to help, and that you don't have to fear so many of the parts of them that cause serious symptoms. Uh, and you don't have to think of them in, in these pathological ways we've been trained to. And that it's safe to be very uh, disclosive about, as you're saying, Tracy, your, your own vulnerabilities. Um, and that clients actually appreciate that as long as you <laughs> follow up and work on it so they don't keep getting in the way of the therapy. Right. And along those lines, I give my clients permission to bust my parts when they start when they see them and they're getting in the way. So, um, and you know, again, a lot of therapists are trained to not be that disclosive and to uh, be the expert and to to fear a lot of symptoms. So, I guess those would be the ones I uh, I would target. You know what I'm hearing in this, and I'm, I'm sort of bringing in the context of our current times, and I'm, I imagine you've already thought about this, but for me, this falls fresh on my mind, that you're power sharing. Yeah, very much. That you are an equal in that room. You are a guide because you're holding, holding the larger context of this person's parts, and that's what they're paying you for. But you're showing up in a way where there is a real equality. And I really appreciate that. Yeah, IFS I think is unusual in that way in that uh, there's so much respect for the client's self and for how much their parts have really been trying to serve them even though they can get extreme and, and uh, be destructive sometimes. Yeah. And, and that it's a collaboration in the true sense of the word and that you know, we're all humans with lots of parts and they're, all our parts are in the room together. And my job is to, to catch mine and help them not get in the way. And if I can stay in what I call self and the client senses that, then their protective parts relax and their self emerges. And then it's, you know, it's magic. It's really sacred work. Because uh, myself and the client self are together uh, helping them with their parts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, confession, I came up as a therapist in Gestalt therapy. So uh -huh. parts work was part of my DNA, but something that I've liked about internal family systems is there's a way in which I think there was a notion of good parts and bad parts. Yeah. And, and, IFS does not do that. 
you're always seeing how a part is there to serve and it's carrying some kind of burden that it needs to be unburdened from in order to shift. But there's nothing good or bad per se. Um, what I'm curious about is this notion of where parts come from. Like, why are we all, I mean, first of all, I want to just name, it's, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's, IFF, it's your theory that we're all multiples, that our self is not static, and that yeah. we have multiple parts, all of us. And my question to you is, why? Why is that so? Yeah, you know, that's an important question that I've struggled <laughs> with over the years. And the conclusion I've come to is that it's the natural state of the mind to be multiple, that we one mind couldn't do everything we have to do simultaneously to thrive. Mm. And so we're born with all these different sub-minds that uh, what we think of as thinking is just them interacting a lot of the time or fighting or, uh, or talking to us about what we should do. And that, uh, that is, as I say, we're born with that and you know infant researchers like barry brazelton will talk about five discrete states that infants rotate through mm -hmm. and maybe those are the parts that are online when you're born and then the others are dormant until the time arrives when they're needed and so i don't know tracy if you have kids but i do okay you might okay. remember that day when you put <laughs> your two-year-old to bed, <laughs> your compliant little two-year-old, <laughs> and overnight in came the part that said no to everything. I do. I think I still have some trauma from it, to be quite honest. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's sort of what I'm talking about, that they just pop in when the developmental time is right and are here to help us, but that traumas and attachment injuries, you know, bad parenting, force them out of their naturally valuable states into these extreme roles that can be, that maybe were necessary during the trauma to, to save you, but uh, aren't necessary, but they think they are because they're still frozen in those times. And so they, they become quite extreme and, and uh, can be destructive in our lives. Mm. And you also mentioned this concept I have of burdens, and that turns out to be really, really key because uh, the d definition of a burden is a, an extreme belief or emotion or energy that came into us from some uh, trauma or you know, bad event in our lives. And attaches almost like a virus you know virus is a popular word now <laughs> um, we'll make sure we put it in the seo for the show notes that's great <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um and then drives the the way the parts operate mm -hmm. almost like a virus and so too many uh forms of psychotherapy and maybe gestalt included uh as well as as our culture have assumed that parts are the burdens they carry. Right. They've conflated them. And so they, they go to war against the extreme belief or emotion, uh, not knowing that in doing that, they're polarizing or exiling the part that carries that. When in fact, they could simply get to know that part and help it unburden, help it release those extreme beliefs and emotions. Hmm. Yeah, so parts become quite extreme from picking up these different burdens that get stuck to them. And uh, our culture and many forms of psychotherapy assume they are the burden and go after them, try to get rid of them or argue with them or fight with them, go to war against them, which only makes them more extreme in general. And that becomes a vicious cycle where the more you fight with it, the more powerful it becomes to the point where you have big symptoms. And so our approach is instead to become curious about why they do what they do and, uh, and then learn about the burden they carry and then help them 
feel safe enough to unburden, to release these extreme beliefs and emotions, at which point they immediately transform into their naturally valuable states, uh, almost like a curse has been lifted. Mm. And so this is a model of transformation. It's not a model of just kind of be mindfully accepting of what you have in there. It's a model of go to what's in there with compassion, like you would a suffering being, and help it transform. And it sounds like by approaching the parts in that way, it creates a collabor- an internal collaboration and an internal sense of safety that then allows that part to sort of soften and return back to its natural state. Is that right? That's right. What happens is uh, this, this sort of essence inside of people that we access before we have them start working with their parts that I call the self with a capital S. As, as parts experience that self, yourself, uh, and they sense there is this leadership in there, and they don't have to be these internal, what I call parental children, you know, like from family therapy, parentified children. Yep. Because there's somebody who can handle the world, and they feel more connected again to yourself. Then they can relax, and they can trust uh, that somebody's on top of everything, and then they, they can get to know each other in depolarized ways and start to collaborate. So I, if somebody has had a pretty good childhood, are they going to have no parts then? No, everybody's going to have parts, <laughs> but they won't have many burdened parts. Okay. They won't have many parts that are extreme, and they might not even notice their parts much because when, when your parts get along and are in harmony and don't stand out, you feel pretty unitary. You don't think of yourself or feel like you're multiple at all. Um, so, but, and that's one of the goals is to return uh, your system to that kind of harmony mm-hmm. that it was originally before you started getting burdened this way. Mm-hmm. And also to restore trust in self-leadership. Mm-hmm. Where that self is actually holding all the parts in a way and that there's an, is, is it kind of like there's an inner committee that in the unburdening process, when the parts get returned to their natural state, that there's a, an inner committee or is it, 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 is it that the self is the boss and everybody else falls in line? You know, the self, the boss isn't necessarily the proper word, but it is a good, <laughs> it's a good internal parent, put it that way. And uh, so is loving and doesn't order everybody around and but can be dis, you know disciplined parts when they're too extreme and but does it you know, with compassion so mm-hmm. as i was doing this work and i was running into self and clients because i was asking parts as a family therapist was my background so i was trying to have some parts talk to each other and getting others to step out and give us the space and as I was doing that, people would suddenly, this other person would pop out mm-hmm. who, knew how to, who knew how to heal all this and knew how to, to interact with these parts in loving ways. And I would do it in other clients and it was like the same person popped out. And it's, again, sort of knew how to take over the session and heal their system. And I started asking, what part of you is that? And clients would say, that's not a part like these others, that's me. Mm-hmm. myself so I started calling that the self with the capital S mm-hmm. and now it's almost 40 years later it turns out everybody has that self and it can't be damaged and it it manifests what we call the eight C's which are qualities of self which include curiosity calm clarity compassion confidence uh, creativity connectedness, and what did I miss? Courage? Yeah. So those are the qualities that come forward when you access self and, uh, and, and are brought to bear on helping these parts. Mm. Mm. You know, Sidewalk Talk listeners sit out on sidewalks and listen to people. Mm-hmm. 
And what comes to mind as you're talking about the self and parts is what might a listener need to be mindful of when they're listening to someone where their parts might come up and maybe not empathize so well? Yeah. So um, it's similar to just in a therapy session when you're Mm -hmm. with a client and, you know, we all have our own histories and we all have parts that are stuck in different scenes in the past and, uh, and parts that we don't want to feel again. Uh, some those we call exiles. And so as your, your sidewalk, uh, sidewalk talk. Mm-hmm. is, uh, maybe getting very, very sad and, and vulnerable and, uh, and talking about a really, really sad story, you might have parts that really start to get resonant, you know, identify with the story and start to come up. And you might have other parts that don't want you to go there, that don't want you to feel that anymore. And so if that's the case, then you'll start to either change the subject or just kind of drift away Mm -hmm. while the other person's talking or in some way you'll you'll avoid uh having to sit with your own exiled parts that are being triggered and that your uh your partner will pick up on that they'll notice that you've you've kind of disappeared on them or that you're getting agitated or something like that Mm -hmm. so but that's just one of many, many different kinds of parts that can be triggered as you try to really deeply listen to somebody's story. Um, You know, they might start to talk about things you have uh, strong opinions about. Mm -hmm. and uh, Those parts are gonna jump in uh, or parts that wanna shake them, you know. (laughs) Mm -hmm. That wanna be right or that wanna be self-righteous or Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Or they're getting impatient or whatever it is. And so mm-hmm. as I'm listening to somebody, I'm kind of noticing the parts that are popping up. And in my head, if you had a microphone in my head, you'd hear some version of, it's okay, just let me stay. Mm-hmm. So just step back, just wait. You know, you, in my office, I was like, you, can, you guys can go in the waiting room for a little while. And uh, I'll talk to you after the session. Just let me stay with her. Mm-hmm. And and I'll I'll feel this very palpable shift when that happens, and my head will clear up, and uh, I'll feel you know there are ways that I can tell when myself is embodied, as opposed to different parts, and I'll just feel myself returning to my body, and uh, and then when you know when it doesn't happen, I I'll apologize to my client, and I'll work with the part that got triggered. Mm. during the week with with the person I trade sessions with. And that's actually been really, really helpful because I've gotten access to parts that I wouldn't otherwise by being so triggered by my clients. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I just love the, again, the equality in that. And it leads me to want to bring up something that I know to be true about internal family systems, which is this idea of, cultural legacy burdens because we're in this time right now where this is up right that's right and i'm seeing especially in the therapeutic community and among our listeners a lot getting activated around conversations around race yeah whether it's a person of color or a person who's white and would you be willing to say a little bit about how some of our parts aren't coming from the kind of parenting we got, but what we've inherited from our culture and how that, how we work with that. Yeah. So, so far we've talked about what I call personal burdens, which are these extreme beliefs and emotions that came into you from your direct experience in life, whether it's a trauma or an attachment injury, but there are what we call legacy burdens, which, um, we're often born with or that that come into us just from living in a certain culture and so there are 
legacy burdens that are particular to your family lineage that maybe came from traumas uh, centuries ago in your in your lineage and just get passed down through the generations. And then there are those that uh, come from your ethnic group and its history. And then there are, as I was saying, there are those we just marinate in in, in our culture. And uh, racism is one of those, in, at least in the United States. So working with it is, is similar where you're listening to, you're listening for self and you're listening for parts carrying burdens okay. and directing that compassion towards them as they arise so that in a way there's more mobility in your sense of, in, in, in your, the way that you move in the world. Is that right? Totally right. And it's challenging because I, I am actually starting to get more active and I'm going to do, uh, um, I'm going to do a webinar kind of thing for white people to start to work with their racist parts. And uh, we'll I, sign up. <laughs> we're all kind of, we're all going to come. <laughs> yeah. And it's been a bit challenging because while the anti-racism movement has been great in terms of raising our consciousness about a lot of uh, how much racism there exists and how it exists in us as well. Um, it does make white people very ashamed of their racist parts, which then leads you to try and exile them inside, which makes the racism become implicit rather than explicit. So you wind up with blind spots, but now you're not aware that they're there because you don't even have any communication with these parts. Mm. So I'm trying to reverse that. I'm trying to help white people go to their racist parts and also go to the parts that um, are ashamed of those racist parts and also go to the parts that are blocking their activism and just get to know them and uh, see where they're stuck in the past and where they picked up the racist burden. And then I've been able to, you know, I've done this in small groups of some of our training groups of 30 white people uh, and uh, then unburden the, the legacy burden. Hmm. And it's been very, very powerful. Yeah, it's amazing. I, I, well, I've become an IFS fan, obviously. That's why I had John. I'm asking a lot of questions that I know some of our listeners don't know, and I hope that, that they'll check you out. Now, I, I do want to ask you a few things because I know for a while you, you were putting stuff out in the world that aren't just for therapists. Would you be willing to share a little bit about some of the other ways that IFS is stretching beyond the therapist's office? Because you've had yeah. a lot of really cool, interesting things that you guys have been doing. Thank you, Tracy. Yeah. Um, last, I'd say five, six years. Uh, and we have had a until about five years ago, I was just struggling to make payroll every month. And then uh, through something like this, you know, we started doing more online stuff. And so uh, I could ease up about finances. And so we did make big efforts to diversify our community, which uh, has been challenging and successful. And also to move into other arenas. So uh, we are pretty actively now involved in uh, leadership, uh, coaching and training, executive leadership and that kind of thing. Uh, the idea being if we can get corporate leaders and also some of these people work with, uh, you know, presidents of countries and so on, if we can bring more self-leadership to those arenas, it would have a bigger influence. And then we've also have initiatives to bring it to education so that if you as a little five-year-old get bullied at school, you don't lock away the part that got hurt inside. Mm. Instead, you, you go and hold it and, and listen to it and unburden it in the moment. Mm. Uh, so things like that, education. And then we have initiatives in, in medicine and, uh, and with psychedelics, it's become... Uh, a popular mm. map of the psychedelic territory. Mm -hmm. So we have some projects going in those areas and, uh, and spirituality. I've been collaborating with 
a couple Tibetan lamas to try and see the the way IFS is similar and different, mm. and to to try to help a lot of spiritual traditions view the ego differently because the ego often is the enemy in too many of those. And the ego is just a collection of these little manager parts trying their best to keep you safe. Mm. And they need love too. They don't need to yeah. be disparaged that way. So, yeah. uh, so a lot of different initiatives. And when I said earlier that I feel bombarded, it's partly because of that. Cause yeah. I, so well, I feel you. I'm with you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm right. I'm, I'm locked arms with you. I, I get it. Yeah. But I also, I do want to say again, thank you. I think, I, I imagine that you're willing to put yourself out there in this way because you're seeing the impact. And because I'm, I'm not hearing from you the, the, the time I met you in person and in this conversation that this is ego driven. This feels really service driven, what you're putting out there in the world. Thank you for saying that. I mean, I, it feels that way now. You know, there was a time when it was ego driven and that's when I was getting into, tr into trouble. Uh. And I was lucky to have some, some people that were following me who could, uh, you know, speak to that and force me to really look at it. So mm -hmm. since I've done all that work to heal a lot of my, what I call exiles, um, I do feel genuinely like I'm just not ego attached to it, which has freed me up a lot because I, uh, I was a pretty shy person, I, mm. you know, still am in a lot of ways. And so whenever anybody would criticize it, it would be really hard for parts of me. And that's just not the case anymore. So, and, you know, probably for that reason, I don't get a lot of criticism anymore. People mm -hmm. are mainly excited by it. And I think a lot of that is because my ego's out of the way. Mm. So do you still believe in some of those psychodynamics then that unconsciously people, you draw people to, towards you if your ego is in the way that want to sort of chop your leg, your ego off at the knees? <laughs> well, I mean, is that, 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 that certainly was true for me. Okay. So yeah. I, I, I could uh, testify. Yeah. 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 No, I hear that. Well, there's so many places I'd love to go. And I, I know we reserved a set period of time and I try to be super honoring of that time, but I hope that this is just, just the beginning. I'm, I'm eager to share at some point the different directions we're going with Sidewalk Talk and we're launching a listener training. And I'll just say that parts work and embodiment practice is part of our, our listener training because so often our own parts are coming up when we're it's listening. Fine. And, you know, we simplify it. You know, we're, we're not as nuanced as, as IFS, but maybe one day we'll have something to do together where we can be more nuanced. And I just want to say thank you for your work. And um, it's a model that is deeply appealing to me as a clinician, especially as I become um, more interested in power in the room. And yeah. Sidewalk Talk is all about power and not sort of lording power by fixing someone and your this whole model is not about fixing it's not about finding what's wrong it's about looking for what was adaptive about somebody to develop in this way that's right it's it's about honoring the parts that tried to save save your life and how uh now they're really you know getting in the way but they're just trying their best yeah yeah so this is the most fun part, I think, perhaps for you, of this interview. Um, just imagine that there are these 8,000 souls around the globe that sit on sidewalks and listen to people with this real open-heartedness and a real desire to see and hear who a person is. And this is your chance to speak directly to those 8,000 folks and either a wish for them or words of wisdom. Well, first, uh, you know, I admire the whole project and I really honor them for doing it. Um, one, I guess one word of wisdom I would have is that it is possible to burn out. And um, people who burn out typically are those who, in trying to help somebody, feel like they have to take in their emotions. So, uh, and, and when you talk to Tanya Singer, I hope you get into this, the difference between empathy and compassion. Yeah. Because if you're 
fully in compassion, you, you don't necessarily feel what the client is feeling, what the person across from you is feeling, but you feel a lot for them. You want to, you have a strong desire to help them. And, but you don't necessarily have to feel their feelings. And many, many therapists believe that the, the way to heal people is to feel what they bring in, what they're feeling and carry it for them. And most of those therapists came out of families where they had to do that for their parents or somebody else in their families. Uh, it almost felt like a survival thing for them to take in their father's depression, for example, so their father wouldn't be so depressed or whatever it is. Then it's possible to tell those parts they don't have to do that because if you do that long enough, you will totally burn out or you'll get symptoms of your, your own. So, uh, you know, I think that's what came to me when you asked that question. Mm, beautiful. And I'm going to trust that, that that's exactly what we needed to hear. Thank you so much for your time and for being with us today. And for everyone that's listening, there are going to be a bunch more resources in the show notes where you can find more out about Dick and internal family systems and the Center for Self-Leadership. And... We so appreciate your work in the world and keep, keep on. And if we can support you in any way, you please let us know. And vice versa. I, I really think what you're doing is, is both unique and really valuable. And, uh, and this has been delightful, Tracy. Thanks so much. All right. Take good care. You too. Thank you for being here and listening to this episode of the Sidewalk Talk podcast. If you like what you heard, tell your friends, tell your family, like and comment on the podcast publisher that you're listening from and subscribe. This will help us get the word out about changing our culture to one of connection.